Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to Flint and Walling's 2019 series of web conferences. <clears throat> My name is Dan Painter, the Product Training and Development Manager here at Flint and Walling, and I will be hosting uh, today's web conference live uh, entitled City Water Pressure Booster Pumps. The objective behind this uh, brief uh, web conference is to virtually share with you about everything you're going to need to know about this particular product. Um, and so with that, we're going to get started. The likelihood of this running a full hour is, is pretty slim, um, but uh, these web conferences, we slate an hour. Uh, most of them probably won't run much more than 30 or 40 minutes, but uh, we'll see how this goes. Anyway, uh, for us to go ahead and get started, uh, first of all, there are two models of this city water pressure booster system that are available, and hopefully your video and audio is all coming through clear and clean. A uh, picture of the city water booster should be on your screen. The two models that are available is what's uh, model number VP05. That is a half horsepower, and also the VP10, uh, a one horsepower model. There's no doubt that uh, looking at the last couple of years uh, purchase history on these, this product, that the VP10, the one horsepower, uh, is the overwhelming majority of the models sold in this category. So the one horsepower is uh, without doubt the most popular model. So when we look at this, uh, this city water booster, one of the cool things about it is it's, it's very in integral everything this uh it's all all in one the, the switch the tank everything's all together here in a very tightly um, uh, tight package this uh booster is about 14 inches from front to back and approximately nine inches high so it's a real tight compact uh, product uh, easily fits in in most uh most places or most applications so very small. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to start off, and I'm going to just identify some of the components on this system for you. And uh, what we're going to do is we're just going to work our way from the front of this uh, pump to the back side of it. So starting off with, we've got a tank that's up front. As I mentioned a few minutes ago, this uh, city water booster, everything is in, in, integral to the, the pump itself. And so the tank uh, sits up in the front. It's a very small tank, but in this application, it functions just fine, uh, holds a few ounces of water. Uh, something to be aware of uh, regarding the tank is that it does come with a pre-charge air pressure. So for the VP05, uh, there should be 25 pounds of air in that tank. And for the VP10, it's 35 pounds. <clears throat> now, if you want to check the air pressure, or you want to add to this tank or detract from it, the little black uh, cap that's located on the front of the tank easily threads off, and right below that black cap is an air valve, or some people would call it a, like a snifter valve, uh, very similar to a tire. And so you can easily add air or take air out of the tank uh, through that snifter valve. When we talk about the precharge, you know, the 25 PSI or the 35 PSI dependent upon model. That's the amount of air that should be in the tank when the tank is completely empty, meaning no water in the tank. So uh, uh, on a startup, uh, it may be worth just putting a tire gauge on there and double checking to make sure that air charge is, is present uh, before you begin. Moving on back uh, to the pump housing itself. Uh, this pump housing sits just behind the pressure tank or the, the storage tank. Uh, it consists of a couple of components worth, if, worth mentioning. One is a stainless steel impeller. Uh, so that, that sits back there that's driven by the motor. And the other thing that, that uh, Flint and Walling has done with this particular product is we've embedded a thermal sensor into the pump housing itself. And on this type of product, that's a, that's a key uh, a feature because there are lots of city water booster systems on the market today. Um, and there's been some, some issues with uh, overheating. Uh, so if you've got 
a, a situation where a pump happens to be rapid cycling. These are not exclusive to flint and walling, by the way. This carries across the industry. Um, if you get pumps that are rapid cycling, if you get pumps that, for whatever reason, run dry, or in the case of a deadhead situation where the pump's been activated, but the valve is closed and there's no place for the water to go. All these conditions can create heat rise. And so many of these uh, city water booster systems are installed with PVC piping and, and, and adapters so that if you have a, a, a plastic uh, male adapter threaded into the pump and the pump gets hot, it's possible uh, that uh, you could uh, get enough heat to deform the plastic fittings and create a leak. So we put a thermal sensor in there that detects this heat rise should it happen and would shut that pump down, shut it off long before the heat would ever get to a point where fittings could be damaged by that. So keep that in mind. There's a, sem a thermal sensor that's embedded into the housing of the pump just for additional protection. Moving on back, uh, we'll identify the inlet and the outlet of this pump. The inlet is uh, on the side and the outlet or the discharge comes right out the top. Uh, another cool thing about this version of pump is that these inlet and outlet fittings are held in place with stainless steel uh, four bolt flanges and, and gaskets behind them. Uh, the four bolt flange proves to be a much more rigid uh, connection to the pump uh, in case someone gets, uh, to, you know, wants to over tighten fittings, for example. That's not uncommon. And uh, with the four bolt flange, it's it's uh, very difficult to uh, damage the pump by over tightening the fittings. The inlet side, the side that you're looking at on your screen, will also have a stainless steel inlet screen. Uh, it's hard to see in this picture. I've got a red dot over the top of it, but uh, any water coming in the inlet of this pump will go through this stainless steel um, mesh screen to keep any particulate debris uh, from entering into the pump uh, itself. So there's your inlet and your outlet adapters. Uh, again, they're stainless steel, four bolt flange. On top is uh, in the little module located between the inlet and the outlet is uh, where the flow switch is, is uh, located. This pump is activated by a flow switch and in order for the pump to come on, uh, one or two things must take place. Either a flow demand of 0.7 gallons per minute, which is not very much, uh, but you, you have to have a, a flow of water that, that uh, meets or exceeds 0.7 gallons per minute. That will lift the flow switch and activate the pump. And a couple other uh, ways this pump will come on is uh, low water pressure. So if you've got a VPO5, for example, and the incoming water pressure drops below 25 PSI, this pump will automatically turn on, and 35 PSI would be the threshold for the VP10. So either you've got pressure below the uh, list of pressure on your screens for the, each model pump, or you must have 7 tenths of a gallon uh, per minute demand required in order for it to come on. The flow switch also acts as a built-in internal check valve as well. So uh, that's why that suction screen or that uh, inlet screen is located there, uh, to, again, to protect any uh, debris from entering into the, the uh, flow switch uh, area and, and where, where it must operate and move up and down. Moving on. Uh, between the uh, flow switch and the outlet of the pump, right at the very top, is what's called an air relief plug. This plug is uh, designed to assist in priming the pump, which we will be talking about in a, a few minutes, but I uh, want to make sure you know where that's located. And, and like I said, it's just up there on the top. It's removable, and it will assist in the priming of the pump. Moving on back is the electronics uh, up for this pump, and within that are, is some protection. Uh, not sure this is common with all city water boosters that are on the marketplace today, but certainly with this model, 
a city water booster, you do have protection against dry runs, uh, deadheading, or uh, rapid cycling, all of which, again, can create uh, considerable heat rise and cause damage to the pump if not uh, if it's not uh, eliminated or corrected. So once again, a good reason to have thermal uh, sensors embedded in, into the pump itself. Just for those things that may occur in which you and I have no control over. So the motor, uh, again, this is gonna be available in either one half horse or a one horsepower uh, motor. They both will operate off of 115 volts and the motors are rated for continuous operation. So uh, continuous rating on the motor. The very bottom of the pump is a mounting base. Uh, it is a composite base with a full four bolt pattern uh, so that this pump can be mounted uh, securely to a pad or a piece of wood of some type uh, just to uh, help minimize vibrations. So with that, we've pretty much walked through very quickly, albeit, uh, the various components on the pump. But again, you've got your tank up front, uh, you've got the motor house or the, the pump housing right behind it, the inlet and the outlets are right there, along with the flow switch uh, and the electronic uh, diagnostics and protection located just behind that. Next, what we're going to do is walk through uh, an installation. And in, in an ideal situation, uh, this is how uh, one of these city water boosters would be installed so that when you leave, uh, you've pretty much got the pump set up for anything that may occur outside the pump. And I'll cover some of those uh, for you. These are all in the instruction manual. And, and by the way, looking through competitors instruction manual, this typical installation is uh, not uncommon at all. So as we look at uh, the pump from the front side, and again, uh, what I'm gonna be talking about in regards to installation would hold true for either model, the half horse or the one horsepower models, either model. But uh, again, as we discussed, the inlet is located on the side of the pump and the discharge comes right out the top. So when, when installing these, uh, you're going to bring uh, water into the inlet uh, from the city water supply. This is a one-inch uh, uh, fitting that's on the pump itself. So you're probably going to be bringing three-quarter or one-inch into the pump. And then the discharge is going to go out to the home or the irrigation system. And again, this, is, this, this uh, pump has got a one-inch discharge and a one-inch suction. Ideally, when installing this pump, um, you may want to consider, as this is pointed out in the instructions, you may want to consider a couple of unions. Uh, these unions uh, located on the discharge and, and the suction or inlet side of the pump will allow for the pump to be easily taken out, uh, repaired at some point or serviced at some point, or perhaps in the winter, um, just to winterize it. It just makes the pump very, very easy to remove if there are unions on there, along with a couple of valves, uh, an inlet valve and an outlet valve. And again, as I mentioned, these are all pointed out in the instruction manual. Something that is not very common but should be practiced is a loop around the uh, pump itself. Uh, so let's just look at this for a second. Uh, you incorporate a, a couple of T's, uh, one before the inlet valve, as you can see on the left-hand side of your screen, and another T on the, uh, after the outlet valve on the right-hand side of the screen. And what this loop allows is it allows for a bypass. Uh, so it allows for a bypass around the entire pump. And there are times when having this system plumbed in this way would be favorable. Uh, one way that I, one time I can think of uh, is if there were a power outage. If you happen to have a power outage, well, that pump's not going to run anymore. And so uh, if you don't have a bypass around the pump, then all the water that's going to be uh, coming through there is going to go through a pump that's not pumping and add just even more restriction of flow 
and pressure. So having a bypass valve in place, should the power fail, you could close the inlet valve and close the outlet valve and then go at the top and open up the bypass valve, which would now allow water to move through the piping uh, unrestricted by not having to travel through a pump that is not being energized or is not running. So a bypass around the uh, system is also recommended. Continuing with the installation, uh, and this is this is true with with virtually all city water booster systems that I've ever seen as I've traveled about. Uh, but these pumps, these type of pumps, and these aren't. This is not exclusive to the F and W models, but uh, all of them. Uh, they will not function. Uh, properly if the incoming water pressure is too high. So if the incoming water pressure is too high, um, we can install a pressure regulating valve ahead of the, uh, uh, on the inlet side. This, uh, some people might refer to this as a pressure reducing valve. And you might be asking yourself, well, at what point uh, do we consider the pressure being too high uh, coming into the system. Well, if the depending on the model, if you have a VPO5, which is a half horsepower, uh, the the incoming pressure, if it's above 30 psi, in order for that pump to function, you're going to want to put a pressure uh, reducing valve ahead of it. it. I know it seems a little strange to think we need to reduce the pressure down before we can give it a boost up. But that is the nature of these type of pumps. 50 PSI is the threshold for a VP10 or a one horsepower. You know, part of me says if you've got something above 50 PSI, I'm not sure this is a real good application for a booster pump anyway, uh, because again, 50 PSI is not a bad incoming pressure. Uh, so again, uh, we would, consider putting a pressure reducing valve or a pressure regulating valve uh, if the incoming pressures are above those thresholds listed on your screen. As insurance, and again, this is recommended, although quite frankly, rarely performed, but as added insurance, uh, and, and and this, I'm just coming out of the instruction manual with this, is a uh, pressure uh, uh, regulating valve on the discharge. Uh, the purpose for this, as I mentioned, for added insurance, it's to ensure that the maximum water does not exceed, the maximum water pressure, sorry about that, uh, does not exceed local plumbing codes. So having a pressure release valve on the discharge uh, would keep the unit from, uh, would give the unit protection in uh, the case of overpressurization. Uh, short of that pressure uh, reducing valve, having a pressure release valve, or a pressure regulating valve, having a pressure release valve. If, if you don't put the regulator in, put a pressure release valve in. Uh, kind of like what they put on water heaters, right? So if the pressure gets up, pressure release valve opens up and relieves the pressure. So and of course, any pressure release valve ought to have a drain, uh, and that drain should be directed to uh, either like a sump pump basin or a floor drain of some type, so it just doesn't arbitrarily just flow out of this pressure uh, relief valve. But what I just covered for you is the ideal installation uh, with all the safeguards in place. Uh, many times, as I mentioned, when I go on these, I just basically see an inlet and an outlet and very little beyond that. But it is recommended, uh, just so you know, and is it included in the instruction operator's manual. But at this point, uh, the installation of this type of pump is complete. Um, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about priming the pump next. And so when priming the pump, uh, this is the steps that you would use to prime this pump. So after the installation is done and with the pump powered off, okay, so there's no power to the pump, uh, the installation is complete, now we're gonna prime the pump. Step one, 
The first thing we're going to do is we're going to unthread that air relief valve plug that I showed you when we were identifying some of the system components. Again, that plug is located just between the flow switch and the discharge of the, uh, of the pump. Uh, step two would be to close the uh, bypass valve. So you close that bypass valve and then open the inlet and open the outlet valves slowly. This will allow uh, water to come into the pump. It will vent the air off out of the air relief plug. And you'll continue to let that water run in slowly until the pump cavity has had a chance to remove all the air and you begin to get water out of that air relief plug. Uh, once you've done that, that kind of ensures that we've got the pump housing and the line coming into the pump is, is uh, these are much easier to, to prime than a centrifugal pump that's using lake water or cistern. These are city water supplies. Water is being fed right to the pump itself. And so once you get a, you turn the valves on slowly so that, that this doesn't take very long to prime, but you want to allow the air to purge out the air plug at the top. And once water comes out of there, then you can go ahead and retighten that air plug and you are fully primed. So very, very easy to prime this pump. So we've identified some of the components. We've uh, talked about the, uh, some of the installation and uh, briefly discussed the priming. I want to move to the performance of this pump now. Um, this pump is, is again, uh, it's, uh, by its name, auto, uh, it's a city water booster pump. And to give you some idea, uh, I was on a job a few years ago, and one of our distributors, outside sales guy, had taken a pump home and installed it in his own home. I believe it was over the weekend, but he invited some of his customers to come over and they were cooking dogs and hot dogs and bratwurst, and they, they could actually observe uh, the difference that this city water booster pump made in his irrigation system. So what you see on your screen now is uh, a picture of his irrigation system uh, prior to powering the pump up. Once he powered the pump up, you can see the difference that it makes. And so you can see with the pressure boost that uh, uh, it make, made a big difference in, in his uh, irrigation system. This area here called a rain curtain was much more dominant after the pressure boost than it was prior to. And uh, so he got much more effective coverage uh, with the irrigation uh, as it moved out across his lawn and landscape. Performance charts. Um, the, there's two charts on here. The one at the top is, is basically for the VP05, the half horsepower model. The one down at the bottom is for the VP10, the one horsepower model, with two notations above each talking about that incoming pressure. Now, if it's too high, we need to bring it back down so that we, we can make the pump function as it's designed to do. But just to give you an idea of how to read these charts, uh, let's look at the bottom chart, uh, the one for the VP10. And for an example, if you had an inlet pressure, you see the pressure column over on the far left-hand side. If you had an inlet pressure of 30 PSI, and coming across the top of the chart are flow rates in gallons per minute. It starts at 3, goes to 21. Uh, for irrigation, what we'll do is we'll probably pick out that 15 to 18 gallon per minute range. So you got 30 PSI coming in. It goes through this booster pump. And the system pressure will then become dependent upon flow rate at 15 gallons per minute. You're going to take that 30 PSI to 70. At 18 gallon a minute, you're going to take the 30 PSI to 65, as you can see indicated on the chart. It's important to understand that uh, the 70 and the 65 values that you see out there in the body of the chart, this is total system pressure. This is not the boost you're getting, it's the incoming pressure along with the boost. So inlet pressure plus the boost is gonna give you your system pressure. So it's not a 70 pound boost, it's a rather a 40 pound boost on a 30 pound incoming pressure. I think you all probably got that 
pretty good now. So um, these pumps put out a lot of water, a lot of pressure, and uh, great for applications. I want to talk a little bit about the protection um, located in the back of this pump. Uh, what you have is you've got protection against dry run, deadheads, and rapid cycling. So for the dry run and the rapid cycling, uh, the pump will shut down to protect itself. Hourly, it will come on to determine if the conditions still exist. So it won't shut down and stay shut down. It'll come back on and detect whether the condition's still there. If uh, the condition went away, then the pump self-corrects and it's back on stream again. Um, in the case of a deadhead, uh, the pump will shut down to protect itself. And then once water flow is restarted, the pump will automatically restart itself as well. So um, I'm sure everybody understands that a deadhead situation is typically when a, 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 the, the outlet of the, the pump, the, the, the supply line uh, that's going out has, has a valve that's been closed. And so the pump is pumping against a closed valve. That's referred to oftentimes as deadhead. So in either case, deadhead, rapid cycle, or dry run, this pump does have protection uh, so that it just doesn't sit there and self-destruct under these conditions. Uh, one thing to note, uh, you can reset the pump manually if you unplug it for about five seconds and then plug it back in. The protection on the back, uh, there'll be a label on the, uh, the electronics portion of the pump this is what that label looks like. Uh, let's just go through this real quick so that uh, we can understand what, uh, what each of these mean. So if the green light is illuminated, indicates that there's power, and it will always be on when connected to power, irrespective of whether the pump's running or not. It'll just be a quick visual knowing that the pump has power. If you get a red button or a red light that, that illuminates, that is going to be an indication of some type of failure. And so uh, turn on when there, the red light will turn on when there's a demand for water. So uh, when somebody opens the irrigation system up or the irrigation system starts to run and that red light comes on, that's an indication that the pump's not getting any water, and so it's under a dry run condition. And then the amber light, the yellow light at the bottom, it will turn on when water is being used. That means it's under normal operation. So when water's being used, you'll have a green light on and you'll have a yellow light on. Um, the only time the red light comes on is if there's a failure of some type, but the yellow light will remain consistent as long as water is being used. If, on the other hand, the yellow light turns on intermittently when no water is being used at all, um, and it's sitting there and it just kind of comes on and off, it flashes, that'll indicate a leak in the system somewhere. So again, this pump's got both protection and diagnostics uh, on board. To wind this down, um, the ambient temperature, this is just some operating conditions. So the ambient temperature range is anything from 32 to 104 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, freezing or removing the pump from maintenance. Uh, the pump and all the piping must be protected from freezing. And uh, where we're located here in Indiana, that's a big deal right now this time of the year. Uh, but if you want to winterize the pump, unplug it from the power source. Uh, close those inlet and outlet ball valves, uh, open the bypass valve up, and uh, relieve the pressure from the pump. And then remove the pump using the unions and the union connections. So again, pretty, pretty easy to, if you've got the unions in place and the valves in place on initial uh, installation, it makes it very, very easy then to service the pump or remove it uh, to keep it from freezing. And then lastly, of course, you want to store the pump in a heated area. Everything discussed thus far in this web conference is, is certainly available in the uh, owner operator manual um, so that uh, uh, everything's in there, uh, parts breakdown, uh, troubleshooting guide, so on and so forth. I do want to make you aware that if you would like a copy um, 
of this uh, uh, training module. Uh, there is a, a city water booster training module available that has everything in it that you've seen on your screen today and then some. Uh, on the bottom of your dashboard, there should be a little uh, button down there that you can click uh, and you can download a PDF version of our uh, city water booster pump uh, training module. Pretty cool. And then there's a little quiz in the back, just FYI. If for whatever reason you're not successful downloading the uh, downloading it off this uh, off this conference call, uh, that's the form number for the uh, city water booster FW2041, and just uh, drop an email to marketing at flintandwalling.com, and we'll be sure to uh, get your copy sent out to you straight away. I'm looking up and we're uh, 35 minutes into this. We're gonna end in the next two or three minutes. So as I mentioned, rarely will these typically run one hour, uh, but our next web conference will be next Friday, same time, same station. Uh, the title of next week's web conference will be uh, Irrigation Pumps Overview. This uh, objective there is for you to be able to identify a variety of different pumps uh, used in irrigation by simply a visual inspection. Um, you don't have to run off and look at a model number, snag a catalog, go online. Uh, my objective is that you can look at a pump visually and immediately uh, determine what type of a pump that is. And so that's what we're gonna be covering next Friday on this uh, web conference. Uh, you can also go to our website, flintonwalling.com and click on the training and i think most of you here that registered today's already done this and been through that click on the training and um, you'll see that we've got the uh, entire uh, web conference uh, roster or schedule for the next couple of two or three months listed on there and you're welcome to any uh, of those that you'd like to attend uh, with that i'm going to conclude the uh, web conference for the day i do appreciate uh, your time and I wish you the best of weekends. Thank you very much.